I have the honor of introducing my colleague, Anna Vaz. She is a associate professor of English. So we have a bit from the perspective also English studies literature at Linköping University in Sweden. She is the author of several interesting, very interesting uh, books. One of it of Angela Carter and Surrealism, a feminist libertarian aesthetic. Uh, 2016. She is the editor of Surrealist Woman's Writing, a critical exploration with Manchester University Press 2020, a history of the Surrealist novel that is coming out or is it already out? It's just come out actually. Oh, great. <laughs> so congratulations. <laughs> yeah. She has published extensively on the work of Leonora Carrington and Dorothea Tanning. Um, yep. We are looking forward to uh, a publication. Yeah, we have. Um, yeah. And you are currently writing a monograph on the intersection of surrealist women's art and writing and theories on écriture féminine. Um, <laughs> great. <laughs> and we look very much forward to your lecture, Surrealism and Motherhood, Max Ernst and Dorothea Tanning. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Lana. And thank you um, to you and Daniela and Monica and Eva for organizing this and inviting me to speak here. I'm very, very grateful to be part of this. Um, right, so I'm going to um, give a talk entitled Surrealism and Motherhood, Max Ernst and Dorothea Tanning. And I'm going to begin by speaking about a painting called Maternity, which you can see in this slide here um, next to Max Ernst and uh, Dorothea Tanning. I just wanted to point out that this painting is actually there in the in the background. In 1947, American surrealist artist Dorothea Tanning finished a canvas that she titled Maternity. The large scale oil painting depicts, depicts a white clad woman standing on a silky white rug in a vast and empty desert with a young child in her arms. A small white dog with a baby's face crouches on the rug by the woman's feet. Behind her is a half open door, which she has presumably just stepped through. In front of her is another door frame, surreally placed in the middle of the desert, through the opening of which we can see a creature composed of sails, masts and ropes. The wind makes the fabric swell to resemble a woman's pregnant stomach and full breasts. The towering clouds in the sky, which mirror the colors of the fabric of the woman's clothes, the dog's fur, the rug, and the creature's sails, look as if they're about to transform into a violent thunderstorm. A sense of distress and menace dominates maternity, which might suggest something about how Tanning viewed the prospect of motherhood at this point in her life. Renee Rees Hubert interprets the painting as, quote, an indictment of maternity, which leads to isolation, misery, and absence of fulfillment. For Hubert, the painting characterizes, or oh, sorry, dramatizes the tension between artistic creation and the confining affliction of motherhood uh, that motherhood might have represented for women at this particular time in history. Alice Mann echoes Hubert's analysis of the painting, deeming the, the figure in the second door frame monstrous and underscoring its headless state. On such a reading, we might see the new mother in the painting as existing in a state of transition. Having just gone through the door in the foreground, which opens onto maternity, she is between lives, to borrow a phrase used by Tanning herself. What awaits her behind the next doorway is a position in which she becomes all body, breasts and womb, with no head or intellectual capacities, vulnerable to external forces, rather than possessing any agency of her own. Until relatively recently, the social realities of motherhood in the Western world were perceived as incommensurable with artistic or intellectual life. As Adrian Rich has aptly demonstrated, the patriarchally circumscribed institution of motherhood has served to, quote, alienate women from our bodies by incarcerating us in them. For most of what we know as the mainstream of recorded history, motherhood as institution has ghettoized and degraded female potentialities. 
It is perhaps no wonder then, as Whitney Chadwick observes that, quote, many surrealist women who were striving to liberate themselves from conventional lives and become artists had little inclination toward domestic life with children. These conditions also resulted, as Susan Rubin Suleiman points out, in artistic revolts by surrealist women, quote, against the conventional female roles prescribed by their middle-class backgrounds at a time when a woman who wished to pursue a full-time career, not to mention an artistic career, outside the bounds of wifehood and motherhood was still considered a dangerous anomaly. This was certainly still the case in 1946 when Tanning started painting maternity. At the same time, the US where Tanning was based at this point was experiencing a baby boom, which was energized by pro-natalist national propaganda. As Elaine Tyler May explains, Quote, the ideology of domesticity focused on a nuclear family with children came to embody the hope for the future of the nation and the ultimate achievement of happiness and personal fulfillment for its citizens. Wartime propaganda continually reminded men that they were fighting for home and family and urged women to turn their post-war energies to marriage and children. Tanning's maternity then seems to represent a strong statement both regarding conservative propaganda and the difficulties of reconciling creativity and personal freedom with social expectations circumscribing motherhood in the early post-war era. Tanning's husband, surrealist artist Max Ernst, seems to have been of the same opinion as Tanning. In a poem written in 1946 to accompany Tanning's painting, he calls fertility gloomy and describes the mother as glorified by putrid tears, by childish words and alcohol. This poem was not Ernst's first attack on the institution of motherhood. In fact, the mother figure had functioned as a key target for surrealist violations and ridicule from the inception of the movement in the 1920s. The return to order mentality with its focus on reproduction and clearly defined and traditional gender roles that had developed at the end of the Second World War had also followed in the wake of the First World War. As Robert Belton has noted, the early surrealists reacted strongly against the forced maternity and natalist propaganda advocated by the French government, which had resulted, among other things, in a 1920 law banning the sale of contraceptives. The imperative to repopulate France signified a kind of normative coercion that was in direct opposition to the liberty and sexuality liberty and free sexuality advocated by the surrealists. To artistically assault the mother figure was thus a metaphoric attack on such conservative politics. <laughs> Additionally, the mother figure was perceived by the anti-clerical surrealists as a symbol of Catholic doctrine and sexual repression by virtue of her association with the Virgin Mary, or as a custodian of bourgeois patriarchal values and traditional norms. All these factors then made the mother figure a symbolically overdetermined target for surrealist attack. One striking example can be found in Salvador Dali and Louis uh, Bunuel's film L'Age d'Or from 1930, where the mother of the female protagonist in one scene unexpectedly receives a punch in the face provoked only by having spilt a few drops of liquor on the hand of the man who assaults her. Having witnessed the attack, the visibly elated and aroused daughter escapes with the assailant into the garden, a venture that ends in the iconic scene in which she performs what looks like fellatio on the toe of a marble statue. The mother figure here serves as an exemplar of bourgeois propriety and repressive sexual morality. Dali's largely contemporaneous drawing Sacred Heart from 1929, which features the outline of a haloed Jesus with a Catholic symbol of the flaming heart and cross at, at the center, is an example of surrealist blasphemy predicated on the maternal. Written across the drawing in swirling handwriting are the words, 
Sometimes I spit with pleasure on my mother's portrait, implicating the revered mother, uh, virgin mother in the act of sacrilege. This blasphemous impulse also underpins Ernst's most well-known assault on the mother figure. The Blessed Virgin chastises the infant Jesus before three witnesses from 1926. In this painting, we see the Virgin Mary in the act of violently spanking a naked Jesus, who is not a baby like in most Christian iconography, but of Oedipal age. Three surrealists, Andre Breton, Paul Eluard, and Ernst himself are watching the scene through a window in the upper left corner. Significantly, Ernst's own gaze meets ours, implicating the viewer in the blasphemous event. As Margot Norris has persuasively argued, the viewer is, quote, embarrassed because Ernst Breton and Eloir fun um, function as witnesses not only of the scene, but also to our voyeurism in seeing the scene. We are seen seeing. As many scholars have noted, Ernst's painting is a pastiche on the Christian icon iconographic tradition, and most obviously a parodic rendition of Palmi Dianino's mannerist Madonna with a long neck from uh, 1540. In Ernst's version, the Holy Mother's protective embrace is turned into its direct opposite, an act of violent punishment. The Madonna is hitting the boy so hard that red bruises have appeared on his buttocks and his halo has dropped to the ground. The mother notably has kept hers. Ernst's violation of traditional Catholic iconography operates on several levels at once. Most obviously, it is an act of surrealist blasphemy. Indeed, when the painting was first displayed in the city of Cologne, the archbishop closed down the exhibition and excommunicated the artist, and Ernst's devout father was also outraged. The defilement of the image of the Holy Virgin also, of course, functions as a rallying cry against the repressive doctrine of sexual purity propagated by the Catholic Church. Moreover, Ernst's perversion of the caring mother figure we, the, the state-sanctioned model for women in the post-World War I era also serves to critique and undermine conservative social norms and ideas. ideals. Sorry. In a parodic surrealist reversal, the violence enacted by the mother in the painting is ultimately an assault on the sacrosanct mother herself. Like many of his surrealist colleagues, Ernst was an avid re reader of psychoanalysis. It is likely that the painting here contains a direct re reference to Freud's paper, A Child is Being Beaten from 1919, which attempts to explain masochistic childhood fantasies. Ernst is thereby blasphemously transforming the holy Madonna child scene into one of sexual perversion. In broader terms, many works by Ernst and other surrealists dramatize an Oedipal scenario in which the mother figure or the female body more broadly is cast as a castrative threat and hence punished or violated. As Hal Foster has argued, surrealist art and literature abound with what, quote, appear as symbolic acts of sadistic vengeance acted, in, exacted on the figure of woman as representative of castration. The violence meted out to the female figures in Ernst's works, however, generates ambiguous meanings especially since he is consciously invoking and playing with psychoanalytic concepts and ideas. Here is, for example, a spread from his collage novel, uh, A Week of Kindness, from a section with a symbolically loaded title, Oedipus. Susan Suleiman urges us, rightfully, I think, to understand the violence against the mother and the female body in Ernst's work as a, quote, figure of perversion, a metaphor aimed at cultural subversion rather than as, as expressive of the artist's possibly sadomasochistic desires. On such a reading, Ernst's frequent invocation, 
invocations of the Oedipal scenario, including violence directed both at mother and father figures, might be said to signify an unleashing of the unconscious and its repressed childhood desires, which for the surrealists was the key vehicle for cultural as well as psychic revolt. And symbolically saturated mother figures do not correspond, correspond to the mother that Tanning portrays in maternity. Rather than seeking to shock and unleash unconscious desires, her painting focuses on the structural violence and personal suffering resulting from what Adrian Rich called the institution of motherhood. Two decades later, in the mid 1960s, Tanning returned to the topic of motherhood in a series of paintings and drawings. Rather than invoking a sense of isolation, these works connote intimacy, touch, and nearness. Like Ernst's previous engagement with the mother figure, Tanning's approach is here inflected through psychoanalysis. And as I will argue in the remainder of this presentation, what is at stake in these works is an attempt to renegotiate the Oedipal narrative in a way that preserves closeness, closeness with the maternal instead of its violent rejection. The result of such a renegotiation would be a complete reconfiguration of gender and sexuality. If the mother is no longer configured as castrated, the feminine, would no longer be culturally bound up with death or be seen as the inferior other to the masculine, both of which fictions are at the core of actual violence against women, not just in art, but in society too. And what will follow now is um, basically a condensed version of um, an article that I published about a year ago, um, which goes into a lot more detail than I have time to do here, unfortunately. So it's going to be a little bit um, condensed what I'm going to present now. Um, for example, the oil painting Maternity 4 from 1967 foregrounds the sensual and affective quality of a naked embrace between a mother and child. Their individual features and bodily contours have given way to an intimacy that seems to constitute and simul sorry, simultaneously erase the limits of both bodies. Similarly, the watercolor Mother and Child, also from 1967, depicts a naked woman in the process of nursing a baby. Viewed from behind, the maternal figure is represented by only a black outline, her body the same color as the background. The viewer's gaze is drawn to the child whose dark pink body is set off against the cream-colored mother and background. However, the focus of the painting is not the baby itself, but rather the tangle of outlines around it. Just as the baby's pink color bleeds outside its own outline, so the mother's embrace merges with the child. It is impossible to discern where one figure ends and the other begins. The subject of the, of the painting indeed seems to be the intimate sensation of touching skin. The nursing woman of mother and child returns in a watercolor frieze called Maternities, which Tanning painted in 1968. This work depicts headless maternal figures contorted into seven different positions, all with one or several babies attached to them. These nonviolent depictions of maternity eschew the Freudian Oedipus dynamic, instead resonating with the non-phallic sexual economy theorized by feminist psychoanalyst Luce Irigaray. Irigaray's revision of the work of Freud and Lacan emerges in response to what she sees as its phallocentric underpinnings, which also, of course, permeate culture and language at large. A key project in Irigaray's work is to enable a language of representation that does not depend on the phallus as the transcendental signifier. However, as she makes clear, such a feminine symbolic cannot emerge as long as the Oedipal drama keeps playing out across the body of the sacrificed mother. In her essay, The Bodily Encounter with the Mother, 
Irigaray unpacks the psychoanalytic dynamic by which the mother must be rejected for the child to assume a speaking position in the linguistically structured symbolic order. This matricide, Irigaray states, is the fundament of Western patriarchal culture. The maternal body is thus positioned outside the phallocentric symbolic order and can only be understood as an uncontainable excess which must be, quote, denied, disavowed, sacrificed to build an exclusively masculine symbolic world. The memory of this repressed excess renders the mother's body, as well as women's genitals more generally, into an imagined threat of castration. Um, Irigaray says, uh, it, it's perceived as a devouring mouth, a cloaca or anal and urethral outfall, a phallic threat at best reproductive. And in the absence of valid representations of female sexuality, this womb merges with woman's sex as a whole. There are no words to talk about it except filthy, mutilating words. The corresponding affects will therefore be anxiety, phobia, disgust, a haunting fear of castration. Finding a way of imagining and representing a different feminine sexual economy, visually, verbally, or by other means, will for Irigaray help rectify the psychosexual narrative in which women are defined either as imperfect little men or as castrated holes symbolizing death and dissolution. This is from her critique of Freud, that she elaborates this language. Um, and then this sexual economy for Irigaray depends on the phallus as its organizing principle. Her famous metaphor of the two lips uh, can be seen as her own attempt to counter the phallus phallocentric logic of representation in Western culture. Woman touches herself all the time, she writes in The Sex Which Is Not One from 1977. And moreover, no one can forbid her to do so, for her genitals are formed of two lips in continuous contact. Thus, within herself, she is already two, but not divisible into ones that caress each other. I suggest that Tanning's late maternity images can be seen as expressions of this kind of non-phallic, Feminine, I keep using quotation marks because, of course, irregularized feminine is not the social construction of femininity that we have kind of uh, learned to accept. Um, it's it's uh, rather the, the other of the phallocentric order as we know it. So this kind of um, uh, maternity that Tanning elaborates, I argue, can be seen as expressions of the kind of non-phallic feminine economy of touch that Irigaray advocates. These works configure maternity as a disturbance of the subject's limits by a radically intimate touch, erotic, sensual, nursing, nesting, or gestating, suggesting the pleasure of a pre oedipal space before any separation is imposed between mother and child. In irregularized terms, we might say that Tanning's representation of subjectivity circumvents the phallocentric law of the one, again, an uh, irregularian a term which it describes as the one of form of the individual of the male sexual organ of the proper name of the proper meaning and of course this one depends on opposition to an objected object uh, objected maternal otherness what is on display here uh, is instead a logic of not one evoking irregularized metaphoric image of the two continually touching but non-separable lips, and which she uh, describes as neither one nor two, which makes it impossible to distinguish, distinguish what is touching from what is being touched. Tanning's maternal aesthetic also shapes her soft sculpture of the late 1960s and early 1970s, which I will point briefly to here by way of conclusion. These works too, I argue, engage ideas of gendered and sexual representation, critiquing the Freudian narrative of the female sex as castrated, as well as the Lacanian notion of woman and feminine jouissance as being unrepresentable in symbolic language. 
Both Freud's and Lacan's theories of gendered subject formation depend greatly on the visual, that which can be seen. In this economy, women's genitals, in Irigaray's words, represent, quote, the horror of nothing to see. Tanning's haptic works made from stuffed weed, uh, tw uh, not weed, stuffed tweed, flannel, plush, and fake fur boldly challenged the primacy of the visual in psychoanalytic theory by urging the viewer to touch them. Like her maternity drawings, many of these sculptures also illustrate touch and closeness um, quite literally. For instance, embrace and Cousins from 1969 and 1970, both feature two headless and deformed bodies covered in fake fur or pink flannel and sewn together in an embrace, embrace which cannot be undone. These entangled couples literally stitched together signal that skin equals not only the limits of one's own body, but also its opening onto the body of the other. Where whether one reads these embraces as an intersubjective encounter between two or more beings, or as a conceptualization of the unknown and unknowable aspects of each individual spilling out, the notion of the autonomous subject is in both cases radically undermined. Like the intertwined figures of her maternity drawings, Tanning's soft sculptures illustrate a tactile economy that privileges multiplicity rather than what Irigaray ref referred to as the one of form. For psychoanalytic feminists, social efforts alone will not put an end to gendered violence. What also needs to change is the, the gendered and sexual paradigm that structures young children's acquisition of language and sense of self in relation to gendered others. I suggest that Tanning's metaphoric notion of maternity, like Irigaray's theory, is pledged at effecting precisely such a revolutionary change. Thank you.